Thank you to all the attendees and speakers for being here today. We have such a lovely audience. My name is Lonnie Fung, and I am a um, UC Davis alumnus and the coordinator of DO Med Programming for this year's conference. I would like to introduce you to our next keynote speaker, Dr. Art Chen. Dr. Chen currently serves as a senior fellow at Asian Health Services in Oakland, California. At this community health center, his contributions include a long-lasting career as a family physician and previously the medical and special programs director. His continued service to the Alameda County is reflected in acting as chief medical officer and medical director of the Alameda Alliance for Health, a Medicaid-managed nonprofit public entity, and also the public health officer for the region. He has also taken a particular interest in the Asian and Pacific Islander communities. He was the executive director of the Chinatown Health Clinic in New York, served on the board of directors of the National Council of Asian and Pacific Islander Physicians, and chaired the board of directors of the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum, a national policy and advocacy organization whose mission is to improve the health status of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Dr. Chen's accomplishments are far-reaching and extend beyond the allotted time for this introduction. Therefore, let me allow him to tell you about himself. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Art Chen. Well, good morning, everybody. And thank you very much for that warm introduction, Lonnie. And a thank you to all of you who have been acknowledged already, who participated in the planning of this amazing conference. Um, I had the pleasure of being driven up here by Claire Brownfield, uh, one of the coordinators, one of the directors of the program, and learned a lot about this program. And I feel so bad because I didn't know anything about it. And now that I look at you, I, um, I brought my camera because I need to take a picture of this. <laughs> I've never spoken in front of a group this large. <laughs> and, uh, and such a successful conference. Um, <laughs> and I'm just a family doctor. Uh, and I looked over the schedule and Jubin, you know, Afshar, who is uh, just an amazing leader who helped coordinate a lot of the activities for this conference, um, mentioned to me that there were surgeon generals and deans of medical schools and secretaries, you know, in the cabinet who have been here before. And, and that made me feel really good. <laughs> so today, um, I speak to you as a former alumni, as an alumni of UC Davis, both undergraduate and uh, the UC Davis Medical School. So I have bragging rights to being a true Aggie. And uh, for those of you, any, any UC Davis uh, students out there? Raise your hands, good. Okay, yay, okay, good, Aggies. And, um, and I also wanted to thank uh, Chancellor Katehi um, for, her, uh, for her presentation and also Vice Chancellor De La Torre um, because the themes that came from their presentations I think are very important for this generation of future leaders who all of you represent. Um, being passionate about what you care about, about, being passionate about what you choose as a field, as a profession of a lifetime, and then also community engagement and community empowerment, participating in our wonderful democracy that if we don't participate in, turns out not to be a democracy. And that's some of what I'm going to share with you today in my remarks, if I can figure out how to get to my presentation. <laughs> so I am over 60, so I may need some help here because I can't figure out how to do this. <laughs> so that's my excuse. the one that was this is just your yes okay there's not this is not your whole presentation this is no it's the intro slides 
No. Did you give it to us? Yes, it did. Yeah. It's under our AMC. Oh, that's it. That's that's, uh, wait. Yep, that's it. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. Where? I can do the arrows too. Okay. So a few disclosures. I'm biased, and in in presenting to you today, I was asked to give a little bit of background on how I got to where I am, and I'm going to do that, but I'm going to select, you know, rather than bore you with somebody's life story, I'm going to select the part of my background that was in college, you know, where a lot of you are, and in the earlier parts of medical school, some events that influenced the direction that I chose to go into medicine with passion, um, which was the best for me. Um, but I, my biases are that I hope that as a result of today uh, and all the activities you participated in this talk, um, to recruit people to think about going into medicine for the sake of service, for the sake of doing something good uh, in our society and making it better, and being a good person uh, every step of the way, and being a leader because as physicians, whether we like it or not, we're looked upon as leaders, and our leadership is necessary. I truly believe that you, we can be excellent caregivers and leaders and participate in our communities at the same time. Um, I get to speak in front of you, but my home base, which is Asian Health Services, is a community health center and has many people that are just busy working today uh, seeing patients. Um, it's a tough challenge, but it's a very rewarding one. And these are some of the people that I get to work with on our professional staff. This is the facility. It's located in Oakland, Chinatown, uh, about uh, 70 miles away from here. Um, we have seven sites. Uh, we have uh, historical sites as well, where we've been. It's a vibrant community. It's ethnic. It's Pan-Asian. People come into Chinatown from all over to pick up their produce, their products, their food, uh, to go to restaurants. Uh, it's very healthy, and, uh, and it's a very healthy diet, and some unhealthy parts of the diet, but just as delicious. And where a lot of pr culture is practiced that is a departure from our Western culture or our Western medical traditions. This is a herbalist shop that we, inter we interact with, and whether we like it or not, our patients go to the herbal shop and they get a lot of remedies. Um, and we see about 23,000 patients. Uh, we have 23,000 patients, over 100,000 visits per year in all different types of Asian nationalities. Most of the patients we see do not speak English, and so we have interpreters, but we also have staff that are bilingual. Um, and that helps a lot bridge the cultural barriers that they would otherwise face that prevent them from having access to good health care. Most of our patients live under the poverty level, and uh, a number of them are sitting just above the poverty level. I can tell you that working in a place like this as a family physician gives me great fulfillment, but I'm not going to be rich, and I'm not rich. <laughs> Um, but I walk away with the sense that I have contributed and that I'm doing what I love doing. Um, I'm passionate about it, and I'm hopefully making a difference, and, and hopefully many of you will do the same, because we need you. We need you out on the front lines. We need you in primary care and the different specialty care that's available to, to see the patients that are like this, that are low-income. Um, who a lot of doctors, unfortunately, are less willing to see um, because the reimbursement level is low. And I'll just leave it at that. Personally, um, I come from a family of immigrants. I am not an immigrant. I was born here. I was the only person in my family and my two brothers that was born here. My parents are immigrants from China. And so that's framed some of my view uh, on life, and politics and the issues of the day, the hostile, almost you know, anti-immigrant atmosphere that we have, I'm in objection to that. Because uh, let me just ask, among you, how many of you 
are immigrants yourselves? If you can just raise hands. Okay, thank you. And how many parents are immigrants? And how many have grandparents that are immigrants? So if you look around and look at that response, one has to question what is the problem that we're having right now as a society with immigration reform, where immigrants have historically contributed so much to building this amazing country perspective. I was in high school when Martin Luther King was assassinated. That had a profound effect on me and my development and my awareness because I was confronted with race and civil rights and what were the issues that uh, were at that time very hot in our society and controversial. And I was very fortunate to have a high school counselor who took a number of us students together, our students of color, and said, you know what, we're going to form what's called a Student Interracial Relations Committee, and we're going to talk with each other to try to understand what's going on here. Because my public school in, uh, in San Francisco was having race riots, and a football player was stabbed in a bathroom and uh, there was a lot of unrest, and we needed to come together to figure out how we could work through a discussion and a dialogue on race, and a discussion and a dialogue on civil rights and human rights. This amazing man has had an impact on my life because of that event, and it's framed how I look at the isms of our society and all the different types of isms, even though the starting point <coughs> excuse me, was racism, the ending point were all the other isms, sexism, disabilityism, homophobia, and all the other kinds of rural versus urban. Um, you have a sensitivity, I've gained a sensitivity as a result of having that primary experience uh, around racism and trying to remove some of the barriers that racism and all the other isms create. Another aspect of my college years, when I was at the end of my freshman year at UC Davis, President Nixon ordered that we started bombing Cambodia. It was in the tail end of the Vietnam War. And the pictures that I saw on TV of bombs that were landing and the faces of the people who were being bombed looked like me. And, not surprisingly, when I would walk down a street, occasionally I would get referred to as being a gook, um, assumed to be the enemy Vietnamese, um, or in some cases, Cambodians. So this had a real effect on me um, in trying to grapple with understanding why we have war, and learning something about it. And at UC Davis, I learned a lot about war and the determinants of war and how wars are political and could be prevented and avoided. Um, but it takes a lot, rather than just thinking it through, it takes people getting educated, and then acting out on your values if you truly believe in peace. And then I was also in my first year in medical school. And does this face look familiar to anybody? If it does, raise a hand. I'm not surprised. There's a few hands. This is a gentleman who's a doctor. His name is Alan Bakke. And he tried to get into medical school at UC Davis in 77 for the 77 class and, and the class of 78, which was my class. And he was denied admission. And at that time, we had evolved to the point of having affirmative action, recognizing the discrimination against many students of color and trying to get into professional schools. It was reflected in the lack of diversity in our professionals. And so he filed a lawsuit against the University of California, claiming reverse discrimination. And this had an effect and sent ripples throughout the country. And we had a conference here at Davis as a result of that, protesting this, what turned out to be a Supreme Court decision that affirmed that he, 
that these affirmative action programs were illegal. Um, and even though it had taken a lot of struggle to establish some way of making up for the past discrimination against uh, students of color. And that had an impact on me um, because it brought me back to the isms and what does it take to have a fair and just society and equality for all? Um, we have to be able to talk through some of these things in order to achieve understanding whatever position you believe in. So fast forward to getting out of medical school and I came across this in a presentation that was being given and it helped me um, get a sense, a real grounding of how all of these experiences that I had in college and in medical school um, provided some direction and some grounding on what I wanted to actually devote my career towards. Um, and this declaration, it put it all together for me. And so when I went to work at Asian Health Services, when it was a small organization, we had a staff of about 20. We had three doctors. Um, I looked at the mission and something there resonated. I wanted to be an excellent doctor and a clinician. We all who go into medicine have to, at the very least, want that. But I also wanted to be an advocate. I wanted to look at the issues that were confronting us as a society and try to improve things for another generation, for the actual generation that was trying to overcome barriers to be able to get good quality health care. And in fact, the organization that I'm at was born out of a history of advocacy and struggle um, and participated in anti-war movements as well as in jobs and service movements. And how fortunate for me to go to an organization that had already established this tradition of participation, community participation and engagement, while we're continuing to try our best to provide excellent health services. Excellent health services for a community that didn't already always have access to those services and developing creative programs for exercise and also uh, health fairs and screenings and real opportunities for young people like yourselves to participate in programs, our REACH program, to give a real first-hand exposure to what's going on in the community and what types of challenges there are in a medical career and uh, with a goal of trying to bolster the culturally and linguistically com competent physician supply and also uh, give people a sense of what's real, really happening. Our students have actually helped generate uh, programs that have bridged generations and worked with elderly. And then one of the programs at Cal, uh, they, uh, as a result of participating in our program, the uh, students organized a whole team of interpreters that would be available in many social service settings to be able to constructively address the language barriers that people were facing. As a community health center, we're engaged with our community. We participate with our Chamber of Commerce. And we participate in safety um, that goes outside of medical care. But one of our board members' fathers was killed in a motor vehicle pedestrian accident as he was trying to cross the street in front of our clinic. And so we realized how close it was that we've seen so many, type, so many times when people almost get hit by rushing cars um, and got involved with a program that created a pedestrian-only phase to crossing the street um, in Chinatown in its most busy intersections. And this is what it looks like. Both lights are stopped, both directions are stopped, and only pedestrians can cross, and this has a, a real deterrent effect on any type of accidents that might occur in those settings, and none have happened. No, uh, no pedestrians have been injured since then. I say this because uh, this is a result of advocacy. This is a result of community engagement, participating with different programs um, so that there can be an influence on policy and in actually improving some and preventing some of the injuries and some of the uh, illnesses that you would see otherwise in a community health center. 
We engage our patients and participate with them despite all the languages they speak. If you notice their headphones on some of these patients in the Vietnamese section, we have a general meeting kind of like this, but not as big. We get about 600, 700 patients who come in, and we listen to them. They speak. We ask questions about what they're facing, what, they, what direction they think our center should go, what are the needs that are there that we are unaware of. And they have leadership as well, and they participate in the major issues confronting our community. In some cases, they lead us because we have what are called patient leadership councils, where we seek their advice, their perspective, their expertise in guiding us to be a more community-responsive organization. They go to Sacramento, and they speak with state elected officials, and they also participate in health reform and supporting health reform. And our doctors go to town hall meetings and testify so that there's the voice of physicians and health professionals in that setting uh, as well, in front of elected officials. And we're part of a network, a national network of community health centers of over 1,200 centers across the country, all providing care to low-income communities and trying to eliminate cultural and linguistic barriers. And with those 1,200 centers, there's over 9,000 sites. So I present this as an option for many of you, an appeal to consider you know, working in these settings. It's extremely fulfilling. And it's not enough. This is a picture of an infant that has a rat bite. This is a picture of a young girl, a toddler, who's in an emergency room because of asthma and having an asthma attack. Both of these patients will receive outstanding care from our medical professionals. The patient with the rat bite will receive a suture repair for parts of the lesion will get the appropriate treatment as far as medical treatment, whether it's rabies shots, tetanus shots, and will walk out of there prepared to heal and recover. And the same with the asthmatic girl. She'll get treated for her asthma, and then she'll be fine and be sent home. And then they'll potentially be back within the next month or two with the same thing because they'll still have rats in their homes, and the asthmatic will still have cockroaches, dust mites, and potentially and tobacco smoke that triggers off their asthmatic episodes. And in reality, when we take a look at all the preventable deaths in the country, which was done in this classic article back in 94, uh, but it was looking at 1990 deaths, there's about a million and a half deaths only 10% of the deaths could have been prevented if someone had access to health care. But in fact, most of the deaths were results of socio-behavioral problems, genetic problems, environmental problems. Where you lived made a difference, especially if there's a chemical plant or an oil refinery in your neighborhood. And also if you had problems with diet, drugs, alcohol, and so these get uh, tracked to what are called the social determinants of health, Professor De La Torre's uh, area of expertise, and something that we came on to uh, many, many years before, but it got formalized and it started to attract a lot of attention when the WHO put out a document in 1998 that, that looked at all of these different root causes of a health in a society, of disease, an illness in a society. And they did a follow, and everything from your social situation, your work situation, where you live, environmental exposures when you're a child, uh, social exclusion, um, isolation. And they did a follow-up study in 2008 in trying to address health equity, which I'll get to next. And they found that in order to address the social determinants of health and, and wrestle with these real problems, we needed to tackle the inequitable distribution of power, money, and resources. And that goes way beyond the scalpel, the stethoscope, 
and all the other tools that we use to effectively provide health care. And when you realize this, you have to make a decision. You have to decide how much do I focus exclusively on being a good doctor in the exam room? And how much, if I truly care about that patient with rat bites or the asthmatic, do I have to pay attention to also looking at the social determinants of health and how that impacts who's actually going to come in to the exam room, into the health center? And it reminded me of how you know, when I, when I grew up, there was a guy named Ralph Nader who was just getting started and he, you know, raised the red flag about car safety because these cars that were being produced, a Chevrolet Corvair in those days was blowing up if it got hit in the rear and people were dying as a result of that and he, he brought attention to that and we started developing a whole consumer uh, protection movement, consumer safety, product safety. Um, everything that happens Every, the ventilation in this room is as a result of people who have come together who said, what is safe and what is good and healthy? Um, the tape on the wires that go throughout this room that are laid out has come about as a result of people raising an issue about safety. Everything good in our society has come about from people making sacrifices and devoting their time. This conference is a result of volunteers you know, coming together because of a dedication to seeing you have an opportunity to get exposed to programs um, throughout your earlier stages of your life that may lead to a positive career uh, and transformation. So that so one of our previous Surgeon Generals, um, Dr. David Satcher, was well known for his theme of 100% access to care, 0% disparities. But what are disparities? You know, how many of you are familiar with health disparities? Okay, some. Just differences in health patterns among di uh, different subpopulations. Race makes a difference. Uh, gender makes a difference. Disability makes a difference. But we've discovered that certain races, certain groups have a disproportionately high morbidity and mortality, higher rates of illness and death than others, and the question is why? And it goes beyond just your poverty level or your economic, socioeconomic status. You can be a black man and not get the right cardiac medications or an offer to do a coronary artery bypass graft, you know, compared to if you were a white man in the same hospital with the same condition. You can be an, a minority person and more likely to get your foot amputated if you have diabetes than if you were not. Um, and these issues speak to questions around rights and equality. And it's documented well in an Institute of Medicine uh, publication called Unequal Treatment. So health equity is something that I work towards as a result of that background and encourage you to think about. Um, it's to center the capacity and opportunity for all to flourish and achieve their potential for health quality of life, and contribution to a just and fair society. How good is that? That's a dream. That's a dream and that's a goal. Um, and we'll never totally achieve it, but we shouldn't stop. Um, we should try. And fortunately, Health and Human Services is at that point where they're developing a plan. They actually, you know, and, and I've had a chance to oversee some of that plan. I sit on the advisory committee for minority health and I also participate in a regional team that is overseeing health equity promotion throughout our country. I'm, in re I'm assigned to Region 9. So there's documents that can be uh, researched and pulled together that show some of this activity, and yet we deal with a harsh reality right now. There's a government shutdown. There is some extremism. There is some misinformation. Um, and we have a situation where we're deadlocked and moving forward on something that is the biggest breakthrough in health reform in the last 50, 60 years, which was approved and signed into law and then fought in the Supreme Court and prevailed. And yet it is complex. Obamacare is complex. It could have been simpler, and I'll say more about that. 
but the reality is six out of 10 uninsured people will actually get affordable health insurance. But it's labeled, it's marginalized. I mean, even a question of one of those isms coming back and the way that President Obama is portrayed in trying to advance health care for all and some of the confusion that's out there. For those of you that are aware, Medicare is a government program. And so some of the protesters are a little bit mixed up on what's government, what's not, but yelling anti-government slogans. I happen to be a member of an organization called Physicians for a National Health Program. And we advocate a Medicare for all. What has already been in place in several developed countries, Canada, Australia, Scotland, and different parts of Europe. But it's national health insurance in a private setting of a delivery system. And feel that that, you get a card, and then you go see your doctor. And that's it. You don't have to pick a number of different options. You get a card, and you bring the card to wherever you go to see a doctor, and you get taken care of. It could have been that simple, but there's a lot of interest involved. Uh, it's not easy when you have this strife going on and political, you know, kind of infighting. And recognize that there's big money. <clears throat> Excuse me. David Koch is one of the Koch brothers that uh, is a billionaire and is funneling money into the campaign to repeal Obama's health care reform. And how many of you are familiar with Citizens United? Okay, not many, but there are a few. Citizens United is a Supreme Court decision that decided corporations can act to have the rights of citizens. Uh, and therefore, it's opened up the floodgates on contributions to super PACs that influence our elected officials, um, that influence our voters because of the uh, material they can put on TV and put in uh, flyers. And for all the fear about the Occupy movement, you know, the question is, who's really occupying Washington, D.C., uh, with their resources? And even now, the Supreme Court, as recent as this last week, is going to begin deliberating on whether or not to remove all the regulations on campaign contributions for our elected officials. So I, I'm saying this because there's concern but there's also answers and solutions. And the answer is with you. The answer is with me. The answer is with our friends and our colleagues to participate in democracy, in making sure that your voice is heard, whatever you believe in. But take the time to try and understand what some of the issues are. Medical training is a socializing process. Medical training does what it's supposed to do. It trains us to become excellent clinicians. We have to follow that tradition and that goal. And at the same time, I would submit rule number one. Commit yourself to getting your education, but also on the broader level around our healthcare systems and how you improve the health of a population because that's not what's taught in medical school. You're taught how to sew up a wound or how to cure that patient's asthma, but we're not taught about how to take one step back and figure out how to address the root causes. And we're not necessarily gonna be the experts in that, but we have to learn how to raise that issue and how to participate and engage in it in order to accomplish a true solution to some of those problems. Rule number two, find ways that enable you to take action on your beliefs and values. What Chancellor Katehi said was so true. You're young, and now's the time when you have the biggest dreams and the biggest, the highest ideals. And I say, hang on to them. Don't let them go. Find a way to take action on these values. If you care about an issue, climate change, if you care about a community, um, or if you care about a particular uh, situation, you know, people getting, um, people getting uh, in bicycle accidents at an intersection because there's no stop signs. Um, anything, get involved and, and take action on your values. Get involved with a community-based organization. There's so many out there. Okay, thank you. 
So I'm going to speed through these because I've been given the time limit. Um, but I only have a few more slides to go. Get involved with the community-based organizations. There's good ones, and there's not so good ones. Keep that in mind. But they're out there trying to do a good job, either providing social services, meals for the elderly, health care, um, working with children and youth to provide guidance and mentoring, support youth programs and so on, get involved because you will see how society and how groups of people are trying to wrestle with some of the most vexing problems facing us. And you will come away a better person and a more informed. Go to demonstrations. Take that flyer that someone is sitting there passing out. Most of the people who you see that are doing you know, some type of activity, they're volunteering their time. And they are committed. And they believe, how many of you have actually participated in a demonstration? Okay, that's nice, that's very encouraging, but it should be everybody, because that's democracy, that's making your voice heard. <laughs> and that's where we learn also, when we take the time from our busy schedule to listen to what these passionate people are saying about critical issues. Create a support group, because if you choose to go that route to get involved, it's a lonely route sometimes. Hopefully not with your generation, because your generation is so connected. But make sure there's some support and look at organizations that are there. Find and get to know a physician role model. If the direction you're going is such that you want to be a full-rounded physician, um, find people that can guide you towards that direction. Build an understanding of how major social change happens, because most of the changes that we need to make as a society are long-term changes. They're not going to happen overnight. But there's moments when there's a cataclysmic positive move forward. Um, and so be ready for that and understand it and figure out how you're going to get involved. Organize, 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 mobilize around the issue you're passionate about. Talk to other people. Talk to your family. Talk to friends, trusted people and participate in getting more people aware of what's going on. The green movement in our country right now is so successful because of young people like yourselves, knowing that you're the ones and your children and grandchildren are going to be the ones suffering the consequences of my generation's abuses. Um, and it needs, it's never just paid jobs, it needs a lot of volunteer effort. Um, create a mutual learning atmosphere because as much as we always think we know something, there's a lot that we don't know. Uh, and that's a reality. And um, the, being in medicine is very humbling because you always learn something new from your patients uh, and on the job if you're conscientious about it and it makes you a better person. But it's also important to understand people and the different people that are out there because we all need to come together in order to be effective if we're going to make some of the positive changes that make a difference. And last of all, take care of yourself. Because some people who work passionately burn out passionately. <laughs> and we need to be able to moderate the passion um, to the point where it's constructive and it's effective. But it doesn't take you out of the movement or out of the picture you know, in the long run, because most of the major changes and social breakthroughs take years. There's reason for optimism. There's an awareness. There are people in the Middle East that are stepping up for democracy. We've had our own venture with the Occupy movement. There are several reasons why people are becoming more attuned to have voicing your concerns in public and actually participating in many different ways, in whichever you can. Cal students participating in Occupy Oakland. And so to close, I'd just like to say, um, for those of you, because you're going into healthcare, the concern is that we try to remedy and resolve many of the inequalities in our healthcare system that are a reflection of the inequalities in society. And, that no matter what, something needs to be done. People need to be stepped forward. People need to step forward because otherwise we're like that ostrich. We're sticking our head in the sand. And so on my charge to all of you, a friendly charge, it's an appeal. 
Stay tuned, pay attention to the bigger issues that are going on, especially when you see passionate people speaking out, and find where your passion is and get, in a, get engaged and move on your beliefs. Take your values and your beliefs and put them into action, and you will make this a better world. Thank you so much for your time and thank you, intention.